are recording. Today I am talking to Jake Elliott Hook from Sweet Bottle. Uh, Sweet Bottle is the world's first plant based bottle. It's available now at sweetbottle.com. That's S W H E A T B O T T L E.com. Uh, you can go check it out. I'm talking to Jake uh, because they recently wrapped up a campaign on Kickoff Labs preceding the launch of their store. In this campaign, they generated uh, over 20,000 leads with an amazing conversion rate of 35%, uh, with over 80% of the leads coming from a referral. And we'll talk to Jake um, about the success of that afterwards and how many people have been purchasing the bottle since they've launched the store. Uh, but first of all, Jake, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm really excited to to speak more about um, what I've learned uh, over the last month. Yeah, uh, we look forward to it. Um, I'd love to get the listeners a bit of a background on you. Can you kind of explain? You know, are you a technical background? Did you come up in marketing? Um, oh, no, tell us, no. tell us about you and I, your I background wish. and what you've been doing before this. If if I could go back in time, I would have done marketing or something related to, to business. Um, but, but no, uh, I started Sweet when I was in my last year of uni and I was studying psychology. Um, I'd done a, a, a bachelor's degree in um, psychology and sociology, which is pretty much nothing to do with business at all. Um, but it was kind of in my last year, I kind of, I didn't like psychology. I didn't really like doing it. Um, so that was when I started kind of branching out, trying different things. And then we started sweet. Um, but yeah, I didn't have any background at all and anything to do with business. So it was just very much hit or miss and just learning things through failing. Uh, where have you worked, uh, where have you worked before this? So, I mean, <laughs> again, nothing to do with, the. Uh, with business but um when i was studying i was just in and out of different places really i had done waitering i worked in clothes shops um just completely random different things really cool uh tell us about uh tell us about the product and where that idea came from so we you made the world's first plant-based reusable ball um it, it came about when I was in uni. Um, I had a lot of classmates that would come in with a different reusable water bottle every two or three weeks. Um, and I would always be kind of concerned and I would ask them like, oh, like you've got a different water bottle. Like, <laughs> why? It's like the third one this month. What's going on? Um, and it would always be the same answer. Like, oh, I can't clean it. It gets smelly. And then I throw it away. And mm -hmm. it kind of got me thinking about the amount of reusable water bottle waste, like not just single use bottles, because that's a, a huge problem in itself, but also reusable water bottles, because over 90% of them don't end up getting recycled. They just mm -hmm. get thrown away and then it's in landfill. So we thought, well, there must be a better material than plastic, steel or glass, because they all have huge flaws. You know, plastic's been around, you know, forever and it will stay around forever. Um, it's not gonna biodegrade. You know, most plastics take over a thousand years to biodegrade. Um, and a lot of the time it's the same with steel and glass and glass isn't very durable. Um, so I wanted to make a, a water bottle, but with a more sustainable angle to it um, and one that could biodegrade naturally if it ended up in landfill. Um, and that's kind of where that idea came from and how we developed it. So I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you two things uh, from that. One, uh, I enjoy cycling, and I can't tell you, you're absolutely right on the problem because I can't tell you how many cycling bottles I've been through where I just mm. accidentally just forget to clean it out right away after a ride, and you come back, and there's this, like, moldy, smelly mess. And despite trying my best to clean it, I'm like, you know what? It just has this off smell, and I don't want to drink from it anymore, and I've tossed so many of those bottles. Um, so... Now I both feel guilty and I'm looking forward to you guys having a, <laughs> yeah, a bike version of this, uh, a bike, a bike bottle. Version yeah, of well, this. well, ours fits in, in, in the standard bike holder. So uh, I'll, I'll need to get one sent over to you. 
<laughs> Perfect. Um, and then the second thing, I imagine there's some skepticism. I can tell you here um, around Seattle, where there's been an effort in, in, in the States, where there's been an effort to ban mm -hmm. plastic straws, um, that the one of the things I cannot stand about that movement is the paper straw. Um, so it's great. It's it's uh, it's certainly uh, certainly biodegrades. In fact, it tends to biodegrade uh, when I'm halfway through cup, my drink yeah. um, in the cup. <laughs> so I'm wondering. Uh, I'm wondering is that is that what happens to these bottles? Yeah. No. We we, we took we took that into account when we were uh, in our development process. Um, no, no, it, it won't biodegrade. Like uh, if you put water in it, um, it, it biodegrades naturally from the pressure of landfill. Um, mm -hmm. so, so the more that gets piled up on it, um, that, that intense pressure breaks it down. Um, and then it biodegrades within two years of it being broken. That's amazing. Um, so, but it'll, it'll last you as long as you want it to, until you throw it away. Sound it's, that's amazing. Um, so how did you discover kickoff labs and what made you decide to run a pre-launch campaign on kickoff labs? I was looking into our kind of various competitors and just trying to see how we could stand out and how we could, you know, really kick off our our brand. Um, because you don't want to launch to just an audience of crickets and have nobody there. Um, and so, so we just wanted to build up a, a large audience base um, just to kind of get the ball rolling and, and get us, um, and, yeah, and just get the, get the ball rolled in. Um, and, uh, sorry, I completely lost track of what I was going to say. Um, we were talking about how you, how you first, uh, found kickoff labs and why you decided to run a pre-launch campaign at all. Because some people will just go and they'll just say, I'm just going to open the store. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, we, we, we wanted to use kickoff labs um, because we didn't want to launch to, to crickets because we because this was kind of our brand relaunch. We we launched before um, with a, a similar product like a, an earlier prototype, um, but we didn't we didn't launch to anybody. Um, we just didn't know at the time. Um, but from learning from that, we realized like we we need a, a large audience to target like right off the bat. Um, and kickoff lab seemed like a great way to to do that and get out to a large amount of people. Okay, so you've been through this personally. So tell me about that, the product and that launch before you did go like directly to market and you said, here we are, here's our product. Um, and that didn't work out as well as you would have hoped. Yeah, yeah. So it was in our, it was our first three months of kind of getting into the product um, and getting into business. Um, we were like, okay, right. We've got our product ready. It's, it's great. Let's launch it right now. Um, mm -hmm. and that's what we've done, but we didn't realize we, we didn't have an audience. We didn't have a target market, like ready, waiting to buy. Um, we didn't have any PR set up. We didn't have any SEO. We didn't do blogs. Um, yeah, we weren't ranking for any keywords. So we weren't even showing up on Google. So we were practically impossible to find. Uh, and we weren't doing like any influencer marketing or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we just we we launched to literally nobody, and we were like, wait, why why isn't this selling? Um, <laughs> and 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 from that, we we've, we've kind of learned that that you really do need to have a, a large audience waiting for the product uh, mm -hmm. to come out because that that really kicks off everything. Um, and as soon as you have a large audience and those people start buying into it, you, you start to see a lot of PR articles wrote, wrote about it. And mm -hmm. then from PR articles, it snowballs into more sales. Yep. So I want to talk about the strategy you guys chose to, it looks like you guys went from um, starting to build this audience on Kickoff Labs and other sources um, to the store. And some people uh, really like to try and go uh, bring that first round of audience and do a crowdfunding campaign. It doesn't look like you did a crowdfunding campaign as part of this. Is that correct? Um, we did. We did actually. Um, the, well, the first time round, we've done a crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. But 
the with our relaunch, we didn't bother doing a crowdfunding campaign this time. Um, so because we kind of already that knew who our audience was. Um, well, the first time round, um, it went great. I think we we raised about twenty three thousand in thirty days, which was really great for starting our company. But again, we didn't really have a an audience to launch to when we done that. Um, and and with crowdfunding. As soon as those 30 days are over, you're then sending out your product. Um, and there's really nothing else after that unless you keep the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so this time around, we didn't, we didn't bother with a crowdfunding campaign because we've done it. Um, mm-hmm. And we didn't think we'd do as well as the first time around. Um, so we just thought, you know what, we'll just we'll stick with Kickoff Labs. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we we had an idea of like what we wanted to do um and and through and through doing kickoff labs we managed to kind of target in our facebook advertising as well and found out what works and what doesn't um so it also kind of helped shape our advertising for now Mm -hmm. um because with with kickoff labs we were able to test what audiences, you know, clicked on the link and went on and signed up for our pre-launch um, mm-hmm. and what audiences didn't. Um, and from that, we find that it's the same people, except instead of signups, those are the people that are now purchasing. That's great. So looking at, uh, it's a podcast, it's kind of hard to do it, but I've got your uh, the pre-launch page that you had from Kickoff Labs up. Uh, the messaging is basically the same as the messaging I now see. Uh, the messaging is now the the same messaging that I see on uh, on your main website, um, where it says you know the world's first reusable uh, bottle made from plants, and it says be the first to hear of exclusive launch offers, enter your email to claim free rewards, discounts, and products. Um, did that change significantly throughout your campaign as you were testing these different um, aud- these different advertisements on Facebook, or did the main message on the site basically stay with the uh, very environmental forward uh, message about the bottle? We didn't do too much testing on our landing page. Um, we, we changed the, the headlines around a little bit um, in the subheadings, um, but we didn't change it too much. Um, I was just too lazy. I didn't really want to do loads mm-hmm. of AD testing. I, I, I got it like to how I wanted it and how I thought that our target market would want to see it as well. Um, and I just kind of left it at that. I did run one AB test, um, but I found out it wasn't converting as good as um, the first one I made. So I was like, you know what, I'm sticking with this. It's converting pretty well. Um, mm-hmm. So, so I, I just left it with that. Um, and and a lot of people, like our, I think our bounce rate was quite low as well. So a lot of people mm-hmm. did end up signing up. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just kind of used the message on the landing page and imported that to our new website. Um, yep. and, and we get the same results with a lower bounce rate as well yeah so i want to talk about i want to dig into the um to the marketing and the campaign a bit more so before you uh when you launched the campaign on kickoff labs did you because you've done this crowdfunding before did you have a list of email addresses already that you were seated with that you kind of let them know about this new campaign no no no, we uh started completely from scratch okay so you started from zero um, so then yeah. starting from zero, um, and you mentioned Facebook ads, is that where you spent uh, the bulk of your advertising budget was on Facebook ads? Yeah, I'd say 90% of our budget was on Facebook ads, maybe maybe 80 to 90%, yeah. Um, but we also done influencer marketing primarily on Instagram, mm-hmm. uh, which it, that gave us really good leads. Um, mm-hmm. But it wouldn't get loads of leads. Yep. So um, let's let's break down those two a little bit more. On the Facebook advertising side, uh, would you mind um, sharing the budget that you had in mind? Like how much money were you spending, you know, either per day or per week, sort of at the uh, the peak of the campaign? Yeah, sure. Our cap um, that we wanted to spend in total was about one thousand five hundred. And overall, we only spent about one thousand one hundred pounds. Mm-hmm. And then um, that's that's uh, that's those are really good. Uh, re- you've got really good, great results for those numbers. 
Um, and then so talk to me about the, the influencer marketing, because we recommend that to people all the time. Um, but a lot of people don't know how to, where to go, where, how, where to start. Um, how did you go about doing influencer marketing? Cause you mentioned it was something that was lack you felt was lacking in your first, in your first launch. So this time you wanted to do it. Tell us about that mm -hmm. and how that went for you. Influencer marketing can be so powerful. Um, but you have to have the right influencers. Um, it, it's almost like every influencer has a different audience. Um, so you really need one that has the same ethos as your brand. Um, so, so it is really hit or miss. Like we, we used influencers and some of them would maybe only get one or two signups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Others might get a hundred, 200 signups. And we didn't work with huge influencers because we wanted to keep our budget down. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we only paid about three influencers and not very much either. Um, and the rest was just micro influencers, like under 10,000 followers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time you can just, if you have the product already ready, you can just mm -hmm. do the post in exchange for the product. Um, and we've done a lot of that and that kept our budget really low. Cool. So um, I want to just make sure I heard this correctly. So I was writing down a couple things here. Uh, if anybody heard me typing. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Uh, so you had, uh, you had, you paid about three influencers. So first of all, how did you go about finding the influencers? Were these people that you already knew? Um, did you use a tool to find people that you wanted to try and connect with? Um, how did you go about finding people that you thought would be worth trying to promote your brand to? A great way to find the influencers is by looking at your competitors, um, see who they're following. And most of the time, they're following someone that they've worked with. So if you just go on your influencers followers, um, or, or sorry, who they're following, um, just scroll down and just check each one of them. Most of them will be people they've worked with in the past. Or if you check their tagged images on mm -hmm. their feed, um, that's also a great way to find influencers. So you went to competitors and you looked at yeah. who was following the competitors or who the competitors were who following. the competitors were following. Yeah. Okay. So you looked at you looked at competing competing products and you said it looks like they're following these people and then you probably sorted them and said like, okay, who are people who are coworkers or who are people who are actual you just kind of looked at their feeds and what they were tagging what they're doing to see who is actually an influencer. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. So, so for us, we're targeting people who are interested in sustainability. Um, so we kind of looked at sustainable brands. Who are they working mm -hmm. with? What influencers are they using? Um, yep. And we used a lot of those same influencers that we found that just kept popping up on our competitors' uh, following yep. list. And so that's a good point. It's not just it wasn't just competitors. It was just it was in general a space. So if people are interested in sustainable brands, there's a lot of other brands that aren't. Uh, sustainable brands that aren't competitors to you guys, um, at least not yeah, directly, exactly. but this, um, it's a related market where you know you're going to have the same audience. Yeah, because for us, I mean, anybody can use a water ball. Um, yep. It doesn't matter if you're interested in sustainability, um, but we know our target market are interested in sustainability, mm -hmm. and that's where we get the best results. Um, mm -hmm. So we knew that's the influencers that we wanted to work with. Yep. And then... Um, and then you mentioned if you already had the product ready um, or, or a product you can send, a lot of it was as simple as saying, hey, can I send you this, this bottle and can you just you know, write a post about it? And that worked for um, a certain number of influencers? Pretty much. Um, there, there's a, a little bit more to it in, in the fact that you need to kind of write a brief and schedule a time. Um, that works for, for both you and the influencer. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but basically when you boil it down, it pretty much is that it's just, Hey, you know, we really like your, um, content. Um, would you be interested in working with us? Um, and, and that's pretty much the basics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what made you decide to, uh, to, you said there were, uh, three, two or three influencers you paid. What made you decide, uh, okay, these are influencers you're going to pay. Did you reach out to some that had a lot of followers and they said, Hey, we do sponsored posts and you decided it was worth trying. Um, or did you just reach out directly and say, we know we want to pay you guys to do this because you have a huge audience. 
yeah yeah it was, it was pretty much that um we 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 didn't pay anyone under 10k um a lot of the mm-hmm. time you can just send your product to them and they'll be really happy with that mm-hmm. um but with uh influencers who can produce really good content and really good photography that you can then use again on your website um mm-hmm. it's always worthwhile just paying um and because you, you want to build that relationship up with them mm-hmm. um so that you can just keep working with them and keep having access to their audience mm-hmm. oh, that's great um these are really good tips around influencers that i think uh, i think people are going to appreciate um so the paid of influencers is that something you would do again or would you just stick to the uh exchanging bottles with the micro influencers um i i think both work really well together um i i'm i'm definitely gonna do more paid uh influencers Mm -hmm. um but with much larger followers i i want to be working with you know 500k up um now now that mm-hmm. it's launched um but the, definitely when you're in the kind of the email list gathering phase um i i think you know if you can get anyone from 50k to 100k and usually that will kind of cost um anywhere between 200 pounds and 500 pounds mm-hmm. um so probably what's that like 800 dollars um mm-hmm probably what you would be looking at um but but i i think it's definitely worthwhile um and it, it gets your brand out there as well and it gets that pre-hype built um because the all their followers will see them using a product that they can't buy yet and i think that kind of builds up that kind of momentum and gets them excited for the product for when it does mm-hmm. release um, but yeah, I would, I would try get in as many people's hands as you can before you launch. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's good advice, no matter what. That way, at least people are, are trying the product, and you're getting uh, you're getting it out there. Because um, there's something that makes you want a product more when you can't have it, <laughs> and you're seeing all your friends use it or something, um, and all these people you look up to using it, but you can't get that until um, you know this date. So I think it is really good for building up hype. Yeah, there's there's certainly something to that. Um, so let's talk about we talked about seeding the campaign. Um, you didn't have a list. You uh, did um, some advertising. You had a budget under a thousand five hundred pounds. Then you did some influencer marketing uh, where you were exchanging bottles and sometimes paying for uh, mid-sized influencers. Um, but once somebody signed up for your campaign uh, with Kickoff Labs, you were running a straight up um, friend referral program. It looks like so. Uh, to explain the rewards program, once somebody signed up for the sweet bottle, they came to a page and it said, share your link with friends to earn amazing rewards. Um, and then for every friend that signed up, you were giving somebody a point. And at three points, they were getting um, five pounds off. At uh, five points, they were getting a free bamboo cutlery set. Uh, 25 points would get people a free uh, a free sweet bottle. Um, and the rewards kind of went on from there where you had a limited edition engraving, VIP access. Um, how did you decide on the rewards? Because we get this question a lot about like, oh, what's too much to give away? What's too little to give away? Um, and what would you tell people who are thinking through that decision today? Yeah. Um, for us, only, I, I mean, I would say only give away what you can afford to give away. Um, don't go too crazy overboard like oh we're going to give away free products if you get you know three friends to sign up um, mm-hmm. you, like because you're, you're in the end you're doing it to make money you don't want to lose money mm-hmm. um, for us I wanted to keep a lot of the rewards early on um, mm-hmm. to kind of motivate people to to share it so we had three was the first um, reward where you got five pounds off um, and then and straight after that um, was five points. So you only need, needed uh, two more referrals, mm-hmm. um, which is really kind of easy and manageable for someone to do. Um, mm-hmm. it, and it, it, so they, they got the five pound off and then all they had to do was just refer two more friends and then they would get a, a physical product, mm-hmm. um, which was the bamboo cutlery set that we used. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I, I think that worked really well for us because um, most people, I think, got around three to five uh, referrals. Mm -hmm. um, and then you kind of find out who your kind of diehard fans are um, mm -hmm. who want to get the bottle and want to earn the higher up rewards as well. Yeah. And so that's uh, you guys hit on exactly the advice we give people, which is to think about the rewards into two categories, the really low level rewards that you just you, you kind of don't mind giving away because you're still going to make uh, you're still going to make money um, off of them potentially. But it's still something related to your brand, something that people want. So it was five dollars off a of purchase, which means you have to want the product. You weren't just giving people an Amazon gift card or something. And it was this cutlery set, uh, which was related to your market, because it's a free bamboo cutlery set um, and toothbrush. And then three to five referrals is something for the average person where even if you're not uh, an influencer in this space, anybody can find three to five friends to do something. But uh, it's really yeah, hard for most people exactly. to find 25 people to, to sign up for something unless you're an influencer in the space. And so did this help you discover additional people that were potential influencers to add to your kind of VIP list um, when you were doing this? We, we noticed, because um, we were able to check the extreme ends of, of who was referring. And some people got 400 referrals. I think that was our highest, 400. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a fair few people getting anywhere from 100 to 400. Um, and we found a lot of those places had Facebook pages in that kind of eco-friendly, sustainable area. Mm -hmm. um, so all they had to do was just, you know, share it with their audience, share their mm -hmm. link, their referral code with their audience, um, and they would they would easily get all those referrals, um, which which worked great. So this is basically you were with the campaign then activating influencers that you hadn't known about ahead of time and that you were uh, you were then getting to take advantage of their audience that you hadn't reached out to before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And just to fill in the details, um, when anybody listens to this episode, these uh, screenshots uh, are going to be posted with the sign up page, the referral page, um, and then also I'll post um, I kind of clipped the emails that people were getting throughout the campaign or a couple of the emails that, that came out. Um, and you guys did what uh, I would just say we, we, we would recommend anybody doing, which is you were sending an email back once somebody signed up, encouraging them to refer mm -hmm. friends and get um, and get their first reward. And then at each reward level, you were sending out an email saying, uh, saying basically like, congrats, you did it, you got this discount code. Um, if you, um, you're only, you know, two points away or two referrals away yeah, from yeah. the next, um, and it looked like you were sending out those mails consistently. Were there other communications that you had with this audience throughout the campaign outside of the automated uh, emails that were being sent? Yeah, and the but we only started doing our own emails in the last week um, mm -hmm. because at the time we didn't know that if you had twenty two thousand emails, that's going to cost quite a lot to to message them a few times a day. Mm -hmm. um, which we didn't factor in um, at the start, but mm -hmm. um, so so in the last week of our campaign, because we only ran our campaign for thirty days, mm -hmm. um, and in the last week, that's when we started emailing um, emailing people with not just automated emails, but with our personal emails, um, and we would just kind of keep them warm um, because so far all they had received was automated emails mm -hmm. um so we just kind of wanted to get them hyped you know like this is a product here's some more kind of sneak peeks and behind the scenes um mm -hmm. this is what the packaging looks like um kind of all this stuff just to get people hyped um and and that worked that ended up working really well um because it because it i think it's really important to keep your audience warm i don't think mm -hmm. you should just send automated emails um because it, it gets it gets tiresome yep so tell me about uh, tell me about a little bit more about that campaign. When you say it worked really well, what does that mean for you? So I I think we had about twenty. It was twenty two thousand um, emails um, that we gathered, and we started emailing people about three times a day in the last week. Um, about two to three emails a day, um, and. You'd find that every time you send an email, you get a hundred people who unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. um, 
which which is so annoying because you've spent all this time gathering all these emails and you want to keep your audience warm but every time you send an email you get a hundred people that leave your email mm -hmm. list um so that was kind of frustrating but in the end those aren't people that you want on your email list anyway they yep. more than likely weren't going to convert um they were interested but now they're not so it's so i hear you I say think. you were sending two to three emails a day leading up to the launch of the store for how many days were you yeah. doing that um it was in the last week it was mm -hmm. in the last week that we started really emailing people a lot and then in the last mm -hmm. few days of that maybe four or five days before we were sending about two to three emails a day okay um and then tell me uh did you run this uh the campaign straight up until the launch of the store did you run it in parallel with the launch of the store or did you go immediately from the campaign you sent out those emails for a week um and then you launched the store yeah so the store was non-existent um during the campaign we just had a landing page up um mm -hmm. which would redirect people to the kickoff labs landing page we had yeah um so yeah and we only launched the store um I, I think we we finished the store really late um it was like the day before our campaign finished was when we actually had fully completed the store um <laughs> and even on the day of the campaign ending there was still some things that we were changing um we managed to get it finished in time thankfully though mm -hmm. um do you have a, a recommended store platform you're using for your, your product? Um, I use Shopify. I just think it integrates really well with everything. It integrates well with other platforms and it has so many apps as well that are just yeah. great. Yeah, that's a, that's a, obviously a fairly common, <laughs> a fairly common answer. That's what I figured. Yeah. Uh, I and they thinking. have really good customer service as well. Because uh, mm -hmm. lately I've been dealing with Facebook and I can tell you I do not recommend their customer service. Just stay away from them. Um, but Shopify have a surprisingly good customer service. I, I will say that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about, uh, we've talked about the campaign a lot. Um, is there anything else before we get into kind of like after the campaign uh, and plans? Is there anything else you feel like you guys did to market the campaign uh, that you want to share with people? Um, we did, we done a fair bit of Facebook ads. Um, like I was saying, I think we spent about one thousand odd pounds on um, on Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. um, and they they were great for kind of finding a target audience um, that we can run a different conversion result for, because um, obviously we're driving email signups during the mm -hmm. campaign, but now we're our conversion goal is purchases, um, yeah. and we just use those same audiences um, that we developed during our email signup phase mm -hmm. um, to what we're using now, and we find that they convert quite well. So specifically, um, did so, you populate the the Facebook audiences with the emails uh, that you were collecting during the campaign to sort of train Facebook um, and improve those audiences? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then were you running um, another common thing people ask, were you running uh, uh, or since you launched the store, were you running retargeting um, just people that might not have signed up, but people that clicked through the ad um, and then retargeting those people once you launched the store? Uh, we did, yeah, yeah. We're we're doing that now, but during the phase, um, we didn't run any retargeting ads. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, now we are, yeah. But it was probably beneficial to build up that audience during that phase that you can then leverage when the store came out. So, how long has the store been up for now? Um, it has been live for three weeks now. Mm -hmm. And is this launch going better than the previous launch that you mentioned went to kind of crickets? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's doing a, a lot better than uh, the first time around, that's for sure. Uh, are there any numbers you want to share with us or things that have gone well or not gone as well as you were hoping? Well, in, in the first day, so I, I guess it's important to explain. Um, we had 22,000 emails overall. But mm -hmm. with using the IP blocker, mm -hmm. um, that filtered that down to 13,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's super important that people use an IP blocker 
um, especially for referral campaigns, because you find that when you're running ads to promote a referral campaign, yeah. regardless of what you do and who you target, there's always going to be somebody who puts that up on a you know a free stuff website, one of these like sweepstakes yeah. sites, um, and that generates just loads of really trashy leads that you don't want. Mm-hmm. Um, and and is, that's the place where it's just people who want stuff for free. They're not going to yeah. pay for your product. Um, they'll refer their friends who also just want stuff for free. <laughs> um, so so you kind of end up building up a lot of bad emails that you don't want. Uh, um, so yeah, hey. I would use an IP blocker to kind of cut that out. Yeah, something I'd never imagined existed was the whole world of freebie seekers uh, before we started Kickoff Labs and then discovered that... It's uh, crazy, we, isn't it? <laughs> we needed to implement the IP blocker and we've also got a running <laughs> list of uh, freebie websites that we just automatically flag people as like, hey, it looks like they came from this site um, and a running list of kind of bad email addresses <laughs> of these people yeah, that yeah. Kind of, uh, we kind of start automatically flagging. So it's, uh, it is good advice yeah, that everybody kind of everybody gives. Code hunters. Yeah. So... So still, even if you said like you feel like thirteen thousand emails were legitimate, um, how does that tra- did that translate well for you in terms of purchases? It did, yeah. Um, so from those thirteen thousand, that they were who we were messaging it in the last seven days of the campaign, mm-hmm. um, and like I said, every time you send out an email, you'll get about a hundred people who unsubscribe. So that kind of it filters down a little bit more as well from mm-hmm. then. Um, but, but we found that we, like our purchases were great on our first day. We, we got about 500 orders. Um, and that was just in day one alone. Um, that's not counting the rollover, um, over the next few days as well. Mm-hmm. And, and we also found that when we launched, we also got PR off the back of it as well. Cause a lot of people were buying, um, and a lot of people just started writing articles about it as well. Mm-hmm. Did you do anything to uh, drum up the PR or did you work with a PR firm or did you, that just start happening naturally as people discovered it and saw the store up that people were making purchases from? Yeah, that, that just came completely naturally. Um, it's not something we paid for. We, we try and pay for as little as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, we're just, we're really, really stingy. Um, like even our you know like our branding our packaging everything like that we we just do ourselves um and same with facebook ads i wouldn't pay an agency to run your facebook ads um yep. for gathering email signups anyway um so and, and it like it just helps save so much money as well yeah well especially in the early stages too it's beneficial for you guys working for the company to take those lessons and really just learn from the lessons who your audience are you could probably do a better job handing stuff off now but then it's kind of, you know, if you didn't know what the message is to hand it off to somebody and say, well, we don't know what the message is. You figure it out. It's never going to work out well. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, that, that's kind of what it was in the early days. It was just making mistakes until we figured out what was wrong and then learning from them. So these articles have come in the in the couple months since you launched the store. I can see on your homepage immediately below the fold, you, you talk about uh, an article from um, Bustle where it says essentially essential for your socially distanced picnic in the park uh, from Delish where they rated you the best reusable water bottle for 2021 and then a Mashable and a Guardian article as well. So that's those are pretty uh, big name PR sources um, and uh, for you guys to have hit on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we were really happy with some of them. Um, so I think we got the Guardian one from from Kickoff Labs. I think it was somebody shared it. Someone had a big Facebook page shared it, and then somebody seen it, um, and wrote about it. Um, with some of the other PR, I managed to get myself just from hounding journalists. Um, mm-hmm. the one thing I would pay for it would probably be a PR agency because trying to get in contact with journalists is really really difficult. Uh, like they're getting like 500, 600 emails a day. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of really just down to chance whether they see your email and decide to open it. So tell me about uh, tell me about the effort involved in hounding the journalists. So how did, um, you know, I've seen people, pe- it's hit or miss. Like people seem, some people have had zero success with PR and some people say, oh, it's great. I just, you know, I have this contact and it worked really well and I got these articles written. Um, but tell me about your approach to uh, to PR and how you went about it. So 
for me, uh, like there's a bunch of tools you can use. I don't know the names off the top of my head, um, but some of them give you journalists' emails, and um, or you can just go on an article that they wrote and then get their email and email them that way, um, which was primarily how I got my journalists. Um, I would do that, write their name in an Excel spreadsheet, and I must have messaged about... 300 easily 300 journalists and i would write all their names and their email addresses in a spreadsheet and whatever once got back to me um i would mark on the spreadsheet that like they've replied um, mm -hmm. um, and then i marked again when they posted if they did post uh -huh. um so i would i would do that with about 300 journalists and then if they didn't reply the ones that didn't reply I would then message them again a couple of days later. And if they didn't reply, I would then message them once more again a couple of days later. Um, and, you know, I was messaging them on their email, their LinkedIn. Um, I was just trying to annoy them as much as possible until they just caved in um, and wrote about <laughs> us. And that was kind of my 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 goal for, for all these um, journalists. Um, so I think I messaged about 300 easily. And yeah. I think that converted to about 15 articles. Um, so so it, it, it's not easy. It's really not easy. So I, if you do have enough funds, which we mm -hmm. didn't at the time, but if you did have enough funds, I would probably use a PR agency. Mm -hmm. I mean, the advantage and there... Then again, yeah, and sorry. And then again... Um, you know, do you want to do it for email signups? Is it worth it? Will you be able to then convert those emails into sales? Um, or is it better using a PR agency when you have launched and you can mm -hmm. make sales straight off the bat of that? So, yeah. Cool. Uh, this has been uh, this has been really educational for me. I love the the talk. How you uh, went through uh, and described how you worked with the influencers, how you set up the campaign, um, why you set up the campaign. Uh, it's all <laughs> I think, things that our audience is going to find really helpful. Um, and so I appreciate you taking the time to share with us uh, to share with us today. Um, before I let you go, is there anything else um, that we kind of didn't cover that you kind of say like, oh, I had in my head that we'd cover this um, or people that are, you know, thinking about launching their own physical product like this should uh, should know about? Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I would just make sure that you're not launching to nobody and that you kind of have a basic idea of who your target audience is and who you know will be interested in your product. Because um, just having that knowledge alone is enough to start running Facebook ads. And um, mm -hmm. that was one of the, the best um, sources for our leads. And I think that kind of got our conversions really high as well, um, just running good quality Facebook ads. Um, so yeah, I, that's what I would say, um, get your audience. Um, in line that's great advice um thanks again jake for coming on and if anybody is interested and you should be um again that's uh sweetbottle.com uh, and sweet bottles spelled uh, s-w-h-e-a-t bottle.com uh, um, and uh, go online uh buy it check it out um let us know what you think and um if you liked this episode, feel free to click uh, subscribe in your favorite podcast tool as we'll have uh, more interviews coming up uh, with people running uh, amazing campaigns like this. So thanks again, Jake, and I'll see you again thanks next so much time. Thanks for having me. Okay, yeah. thanks. Bye.